we'll start one second. Just takes a second to boot up. <clears throat> All right, I think we are now live on YouTube. Start one second. Just take so welcome everybody. I know I take it. There's a little uh, think that we have to wait, and so there's like a double thing for a moment. But today we're going to be doing Jews in theater, and of course we we've, we've been generally doing a lot of different things. We just spent. Uh, a couple weeks. What did we just do before? Jews in, in Madison. In Madison. Uh, okay. So that that obviously was a very full topic, as we know. <clears throat> Madison opened up earlier in America, and then other places. And generally speaking, there was often Jews who were in the field of medicine. However, if we want to find a field <laughs> that was really open to Jews in America then we've picked the right one because no other field probably the Jews find their foothold stronger than in theater, even more probably than Hollywood because Hollywood of course started later, but Jews and theater are synonymous terms. And as we'll see at one period, every major musician and musical theater was Jewish except for Cole Porter. And Cole Porter, of course, used to say One, when about three, how did he succeed? Every major musician in musical theater was Jewish except for Cole Porter. And Does Cole anybody hear that? Anybody hear that? Does anybody hear that re thing coming in? Here. No, no, we can't make it out. It's it's repeating what I said, but I've already is anybody watching on YouTube? I was, you, you but I gave up. Okay, yeah, just turn off the YouTube because it'll double up. Sorry about that. Rabbi, today. can you share your screen? And then we could all see what you're seeing. I'm not saying, no, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I put us on YouTube, but if somebody else is watching YouTube at the same time, there will be a disconnect. Right. Okay. As I have found several times. So uh, when Cole Porter was asked, how did he succeed in musical theater? His answer was, I write Jewish music, basically. It was like, I think I, I think as if I'm a Jew. And so we're going to see that Jewish, the, Jews in theater are really quite synonymous. And, um, you know, it's hard to go into any particular direction. If you go to directors or actors, I mean, it's going to be, uh, the numbers are really quite astounding. But what we're going to see that is different between Hollywood and theater is even though the Jew, Jewish people really became part of Hollywood and helped found it, when it came to actual movies and TV, and well, mostly movies, the Jewish culture had to be taken out, basically. So Americans didn't want to see Jewish culture in movies. So except for the jazz singer and a few other ones. Most of the time it was Jews who were producing, directing. There's some Jewish actors, but the themes weren't Jewish. Whereas in musical theater, the themes very early on are Jewish and they remain so throughout. And it's really quite interesting that theater is almost the place in which equality is found more than any other place. They dealt with racism, there's homosexuality, women's rights. So all of this was in the theater and it was almost as if you were free to say things and do things in theater that you weren't in other places. And quite frankly, it's probably still that way today where theater is you know, more of a, an area of really liberal free thinking. Uh, play, uh, movies like Cabaret of obviously in, in theater like Cabaret show both, but you already saw themes of anti-Semitism and racism in theater going all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, which is really quite amazing because in other venues, it was completely ignored. And so it also had to do a lot of because where was theater centered in America? It was centered in New York and uh, in the Jewish area, obviously, but also in New York. And New York was, of course, a liberal bastion even back then. <clears throat> and so they would start from New York and go out. Where does theater start today, generally? New York, it's the same thing. It hasn't changed as much. But because it all begins there, it goes out. As if theater started in you know, Georgia or Texas and then spread out from that area, it would probably be 
a very different theater. So let's go through and see just a little bit though of the history of theater before we get to America, uh, because as we know, Jews have been around a very long time. So did theater originate in the Bible? The answer is probably not. There was certainly song and, and poetry in the Bible, but there's not very much in terms of theater. Maybe a couple of excerpts or references here and there. In the post-biblical period, there still was not a lot of theater in the Jewish world. In fact, in the Talmud, they really tell you, don't do it. However, Jews did start participating in theater in the air worlds we would think of, in Greece, in the Greek world, in the Roman world. So there was theater, but it was mostly based upon you know, Greek theater. There were a couple of Jews who were very prominent in theater and probably most of those are no longer known to us, but uh, there were even some rabbis who thought it was okay for Jews to go to theater and to go to circuses and go to gladiatorial games um, and to kind of become part of the world. But even though there was theater in what we'd call Palestine, before the year zero, most of it was, of course, Greek-based. And so we know if you go to Israel today, you will see theaters in a wide range of areas in Israel, going back all the way to Herod, which is 2,000 plus years ago, because there was a lot of Greek theater. In fact, if you go now, one of the most important places or most, op most often visited places in the north is an old Greek theater. However, there was none, no or very little attempt at Jewish theater. So it was all Greek based. So there were Jews in theater, but there was not what we call Jewish theater. And as time went on and Christian theater became a little bit more popular, especially in the second, third, fourth century, um, there really wasn't a lot of Jewish theater as rabbis were really insisting that Jews stay away from it, stay away from theater, stay away from that kind of area. And so, <laughs> except for maybe a little bit on Purim, Jews were not very connected to theater, although there were individual Jews who were. But when we think of theater, we can't go back thousands of years and say Jews were in theater. So when did Jews, Judaism become part of theory? Well, let's think first, before Jews became part of theater, Jews became part of theater. Now, what does that mean? Before Jews became part of theater, there were Jewish characters in theater. What are the, who are the, who, who, what's the most famous character in theater that is Jewish? Shylock. Shylock. Very probably Shylock. And then later, of course, Fagan. A few centuries later, Fagan. Fagan. Yeah. And both, Fagan probably even more so, but both had a great impact. Now, a lot of people wonder why was Shakespeare so anti-Semitic? Why were these Jewish characters that were so, what we'd call caricatures? Well, how many Jews do you think Shakespeare knew? None. <laughs> probably none. Yeah. Because Jews were kicked out of England in 1290. And they weren't allowed back in until the 1650s after Shakespeare. And so people in Britain did not know Jews. You may see some if you were a traveler, a traveling salesman, but most people in England had never met. <laughs> they were these people of dreams and of days gone by. They were mysterious, like kind of like angels. They kind of existed, but they don't. And so when it came to writing plays, it was really easy to make Jews the enemy or to caricature them because they never met them. It's kind of like anybody ever, anybody seen any Japanese art? I love Japanese art. Yeah. Have you ever seen Japanese art where they draw lions and elephants and tigers? <laughs> They're all a little off because they've heard of them, but they've never seen them. 
And so whenever you see these animals that you could say that could be an elephant, that could be a lion, but it definitely looks very different. And because they're doing it from just a few sailors, probably heard of the stories and they never seen it. And this is kind of what's going on in England. They don't know Jews and here they are um, writing about Jewish, writing Jewish characters. So almost to a T every Jewish character up through a certain point, especially till the 17th century, were bad, were evil. Although there are some, a few exceptions here in, in certain places, um, because outside of England, there were Jews living in certain places. France obviously had kicked them out, but there were Jews who were in theater in places like Italy. Obviously we talked previously about Italy was at different time periods gave more quality to Jews as did the Dutch. And so in the 16th century, there was a Jewish community and they actually did have a little Jewish company of theater in the ghettos. But um, there were two famous Jewish actors, Solomon Jacob, Solomon and Jacob in the 16th century. And so we have excerpts of Jews who did perform in the 16th century Italy, so it's not unheard of, but generally speaking, the negative portrayals are often based on England and also France, because France also had kicked out the Jews, but obviously English theater is even more famous because of Shakespeare. But there were changes coming, but not till really the 17th and 18th century. And that is when Jews have already returned to England. That is where you having the semblance of freedom for Jews in the next century or two. So we do see in French theater in the 19th century and other places, the start of what we'd call Jewish theater. So why did Jewish theater arise? How did we change the perspective uh, when we saw what Char Charles Dickens did for the character uh, Fagin, which really hurt Jews. How did we make changes? How did, how did we end up with Jewish characters that were a little bit more endearing? The answer is obvious. Who became the patrons of theater? Jews. In a lot of places, Jews were major patrons. And yes. if you were portraying Jews in negative light in a wide range of circumstances, they protested and would not go. And they might not go to that theater for a whole year. And so eventually what happened was you had to have this change. Now outside of course, Shakespeare and certain ones that were so famous that it didn't matter, but Jews themselves were the ones who helped to make this change by being such patrons especially in the 19th and late 18th century where freedoms were starting to become part of Europe. Now, remember, everything is connected. In the 19th century, I'm sorry, the 18th century with people like, of course, um, with the freedom in America, with the French Revolution, with Napoleon, with Jews now living in England for over a century, Jews became more and more part of society. And so we see in France and in England, certain plays starting to creep up, like, and playwrights like Israel Zangwill, of course, many of have heard, and Herman Schaffer, which is not quite as, as famous. And in places like Germany, where Jews had more rights than other places, and you saw Jews now starting to have some access and then of course you started to see certain Jewish plays coming. Now we have to remember that a lot of theater was based on passion plays which we of course know they generally assassinated the Jewish character in those but there was a lot of Jewish theater uh, participants people like Jacob Hertzfeld is probably the most famous in England he was an actor so Really, you saw this 17th, 18th, and really 19th century change where you still had this anti-Semitic rhetoric, but you had also Roman Catholic 
actresses such as Sarah Bernhardt, who was also part Jewish, or at least so she celebrated her Jewish history as opposed to hiding from it. So it really started to change early. And of course, theater does that. And in Germany, all the way in the 17th century, you started to see, see some characters that were a little bit more nice. You all, you, you traditionally started to see Jewish characters who were considered very, um, uh, very kind, considerate, menschlichkeit especially. Uh, but early on, the first Jewish characters that were shown to be positive were generally the Jewish women. So think about Ivanhoe, uh, one of my favorite books. Okay. You have the Jewish moneylender who's kind of distasteful, but nothing like what we see in Shakespeare. But then you have his daughter, and Karen, who is who, Karen? Rebecca. Rebecca. Yeah. And she's this beautiful, wonderful woman who Ivanhoe, you know. And you see that a lot where the Jewish daughter is portrayed in a very nice way. Later on, you see the Jewish elder statesman is also portrayed in a very nice way. And a lot of this has to do with equality in theater beyond what was going on. In theater, obviously, at first it was only men who were in theater, so men would do women parts. So if you were a Jewish man in theater, you had to start sometimes wearing Jewish clothing, I mean, women's clothing. So that of course went against Jewish law, but you're in the theater. And already in Jewish law, they're made amends for places like Purim where it became tradition in the Jewish world for men to dress like women for Purim. And so Purim spiels became part of the beginnings of this theater. But really, if you wanna talk about when real theater started to come into the Jewish world, it would have been in the 19th century, as I think we all probably would have guessed. Uh, that's when the, the world changed in Europe. You've got the Renaissance, you've had the Renaissance, you've got, you know, all the emancipation, you've got all this going on. But in truth, from eight, 1584 to 1820, there were 80 plays in England in which one character was at least Jewish. But after 1800, there was at least one Jewish character every single year in a major play, pretty much. And not all of them were as negative as they would be in Oliver Twist. So most of the time, though, they were either evil or fools saving for Jewish daughters, which really started to change. But again, if you wanna talk about when Jews were able to make these major changes, it would have been in the 19th century again, because they were going to plays and in a, a, a large number of occasions, they were able to change uh, theaters, uh, I mean, change what theaters were showing or, or really make sure plays never got out of the first run because of the amount of time they went. Mm -hmm. So any questions or thoughts before we get really into where it began? Yeah, the big, the biggest one I believe was the Yiddish Theater on 2nd Avenue. Right, uh, and we're gonna go into that right now. So did you ever yeah. go there? Was it still around? Holly and I were there. Yeah. So we'll talk about that. Is at that the, that was ha after lunch, having lunch at the 2nd Avenue Deli. <laughs> I have been to the Second Avenue Deli. It's kosher. It's the most. I told you it's the most expensive meal I've ever had. <laughs> Not only because my wife and I were flying on our on our honeymoon and we had like an eight hour layover in New York. And the one thing we did was go to Second Avenue Deli for lunch. So it, it cost us the cab there, yeah. the cab for a thirty minute wow. tour around the city, the cab ride back. So it ended up being like a five hundred dollar meal. What? When you went to Second Avenue Deli, they relocated to Third Avenue. Right. So you went to the Second Avenue Deli on Third Avenue. All right. So, what happens, of course, in the 19th century, if you're going to talk about Jewish theater, of course, the basis is going to be Yiddish theater. 
Now, Yiddish theater we think of as being mostly in, in uh, New York, but actually there was Yiddish theater was very popular in Europe in obvious places. Of course, number one would be Poland, but in a wide range of places, Berlin, London, Paris, Buenos Aires had a very big uh, Yiddish theater there uh, for a very long time. But it becomes a major part of Jewish lifestyle going to the Yiddish theater. It lasts a very long time, all the way into the 1940s. Uh, several times when people thought Yiddish theater was dead, it would make major comebacks. As recently when they just had a uh, the Yiddish production of Fiddle on the Roof <coughs> is still going to sold, uh, not now obviously, but before the pandemic was booked every night. And so we see the transition from these Purim plays, which really got, they had been going on for a while, but in the 18th century, Purim, which had been a general fun time, really became a fun time with skits. And that really started in the 18th century. And that developed into Yiddish theater in many respects in the 19th century. Now, before we get to Yiddish theater, were there other places where there's theater? Of course, obviously in Spain, during the golden age of Spain, there was Jewish theater because it is the highlight of the Jewish world probably until the modern age. So you had people like Yehuda Al-Arizi, who was a very famous poet, but also uh, a, a writer. And uh, I think even maybe actor. And so you had theater there. You also, in Europe, you would have at times theater um, based upon the Old Testament. So you would see Jews in a better light in those places. But when did G Yiddish theater start? Of course, it starts in the eight, 19th century. There's all of these amateur theaters in places like Vienna, but especially places like Vilna and Warsaw. And the Vilna Theater actually moved to Warsaw. So when you said you were watching the Vilna Theater, it was in Warsaw. The official beginning of Yiddish theater, and I didn't realize it was official, but there is, the official beginning is 1876, because that's when the first professional troupe was created by, of course, Abraham Goldfaden, who is the most famous of all Yiddish uh, theater people. So up until the 1876 day, there was Yiddish theater, Purim plays, all of this, troubadours, and all of these type of minstrels, and they had these shows in Odessa. And you, but really it was Goldfaden who really started it all. Uh, first with this major outdoor concert in Odessa in 1873. Uh, he was already a poet, but he now started to write this theater and he founded the first professional group uh, in Romania, and then it went to Bucharest. So uh, we think of theater, just theater of, or, of originating in Poland, but it was really all over the place, obviously, because Jews spoke Yiddish in a wide range of places, even though they spoke other languages. If you had a Yiddish theater, you could take it from one Jewish place to another, and you wouldn't have to do it. So his theater in Romania which he moved to Bucharest, he could also take on to shows in Russia and other places. And so I think this is something we obviously understand why Yiddish theater uh, was so easy to be taken from one place to another because they spoke the same language. So in Yiddish theater, they would have characters like the Schmendrick. What's the Schmendrick? which was very famously played by Molly Picon or Picon, I've heard her name pronounced, most famous woman in <laughs> You would now have women playing men even, which was especially in comic roles. The Schmendrick was, is not like the evil bad guy uh, Fagin. The Schmendrick is kind of like, what? He's kind of like, like the fool. funny guy who trips over himself. Yeah. Yeah. All, like always making mistakes, but as a nice guy, we'd love to be friends with him. He just is a buffoon, but in a nice way. So as opposed to Fagin, we had the Schmendrick. And <laughs> what we also had, which some was a difference in thought as to what 
Jewish Yiddish theater should be. What did Yiddish theater want to become? And so you had a debate that would last from this period all the way to the 1940s. Should Yiddish theater be comedy, risque, or should it be dramatic? And at time periods, it would go one way or the other, depending on what people want. At one point, Jewish dra theater dramas were not making any money at all. And the way to make money was to have a comedy or some sort of risque comedy. And then at other times, the drama started to really become more prominent, but we go back and forth. Um, uh, Goldfaden himself, who was the guy who originated, basically wanted, started off with more comedies, but he wanted to have a wide range of of, of ideas. He wanted people to be able to laugh, but also cry. He wanted Jews to be funny, heart-wrenching, dramatic, and have the whole gam run the whole gamut. And so he started to take his theater ideas all around Europe. And he took it, of course, to Warsaw, to Lublin, to Vilna, to Balta, he had, uh, he of course was already in Romania and Bucharest. He took, didn't have a theater in uh, Russia, but he took uh, groups there to Russia. And uh, it was a huge hit. You know, theater theater was just the thing for Jews and even non-Jews started to go to it as well. Who were the people who opposed Yiddish theater? I think it would be very obvious the Orthodox Jews. <laughs> so Orthodox Jews, of course, uh, were not very thrilled for a variety of reasons. One, men dressing as women, obviously, men on stage with women, women singing. Um, so the, those were the main uh, reasons. Uh, and that also that Yiddish was being empowered. They didn't think Yiddish should become that kind of an intellectual language. But um, now people worried, the great debate about Jewish buffoonery was, are we gonna have evil Jewish characters in Yiddish theater? Are we gonna have Jewish buffoons? People were worried, what were they worried about? People worried that what would non-Jews watching this think of Jews? If they saw Jewish characters like Fagin in Yiddish theater, if they saw Jewish idiots like Helmites. But generally speaking, that didn't stop anybody because they realized that which non-Jews were going to the theaters. The non-Jews going to Yiddish theaters were the non-Jews who like Jews in the first place or else they wouldn't go. So the idea is we, the people who are coming to theater are people who were supportive of Jews anyway. And obviously if you spoke some German, you probably could understand part of the show. So um, eventually though, Yiddish theater would become very prominent in, in Russia, obviously in Romania. And in Russia, this is where Jewish theater became more sophisticated because obviously Russia was a much more educated world than Romania, which was much more rural, even Bucharest and those places. So when you came to Russia, then, and I'm not just, not just the shtetls, but when you went to the cities, and this really helped to bring Yiddish theater to a whole nother level um, as to this drama, which was really quite moving. And so the first professional Yiddish theater in Odessa came only a few short years later, 1878. It's one of those things that once the first theater in 1876 was started, it just more and more kept coming over and over again because you could make a lot of money because people loved it. Plus you had all of these Russian Yiddish writers that were now starting to write these beautiful uh, poetry, this beautiful prose, and those stories were being used as the basis for it. And of course, this all stopped in Russia very soon after it started, because of course, 
Um, Yiddish theater was banned in Russia in 1883, shortly after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. Again, everything's connected because that's when all the Jews started to leave Russia and move to America. So what did that mean for all the Russian Jews who were in theater? If you wanted to be in theater, what'd you have to do? You had to leave. And so just as all these Jews left because of the pogroms, a lot of the educated, wealthier Jews left, and most of the Jewish artisans left, not artisans, theater people left as well. And they went to where? They went, a lot of them came to America. And this is where it really starts here. Um, and so I'm gonna, I make everybody please mute themselves also, by the way, because somebody's, we may be hearing some static. Um, so this is when Yiddish theater comes to America, but it also goes to other places like, of all places, London. So there became a very big major Yiddish theater going atmosphere in London and England of all places, because the Jewish theater was now educated. It was kind of socialist. Uh, so you saw all of these new Jewish ideas being brought into places, not only in London, but Manchester and Glasgow, like places that weren't quite. And so even though Shakespeare obviously was always popular, you started to see Yiddish theater come to these places where we never thought. Now, of course, the major place in Europe that Yiddish theater will end up was, will be of course, Poland, which is obvious because that's where all the Jews were living. And in Poland, that's where you saw a lot of the famous uh, uh, beginnings, such as the Dybbuk, which is probably the most famous of all the Yiddish theater plays, the Vilna Troupe, which is the, one of the most famous, although they moved to, 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 of course, to Warsaw, the Yiddish Art Theater from uh, Maurice Schwartz. You saw all of these things start there, and then a lot of them would end up going into, of course, New York. But Yiddish theater in Poland became very popular, especially in Warsaw, where of course they had how many Jews in Warsaw at one point, like three, two, two million, a million, three million. It was a, a very, like it was the largest Jewish population in the world. They also brought puppetry, funny enough, became very popular. So by 1883, Yiddish theater is moving away from Russia into Poland, into Vienna, into these places. Remember, it only really started professionally in, 18, in 1876. So, but by 1882, 83, 84, a lot of people are moving to America. Remember in 1880, there was only 250,000 Jews in America. From 1881 to 1924, there's gonna be three and a half million move in. And a very high percentage are gonna live in New York City. A very high percentage of them are educated even if they are poor. And so some of you may, through your parents, have a much better connection to Yiddish theater than I do because I've never lived in New York and many of you have. Some of you may even have been to Yiddish theater, I have not, but there's still. So in New York is really where it took off because obviously they're now, theater is now in the most, the freest country in the world that is becoming the most educated in the world, although we're still second to Europe at this time by far, but we're now becoming the most educated. You're bringing in all these groups of people and of course it booms. It is gonna be incredibly popular. There's gonna be hundreds of Yiddish theaters across the country. In New York alone, there's gonna be you know, 22, 25 Yiddish theaters just in New York. Um, it is going to be an incredible way to become part of the art world. It's going to be sometimes drama, sometimes comedy. They translate Shakespeare into Yiddish sometimes. Um, obviously, we know this is going to be the start of vaudeville stemming from this. But it is going to be incredible. What I found incredible was when you think it's dying in the 1920s, it looked like Yiddish theater is dying and makes a huge comeback. And in the 20s and 30s becomes a major power again. So 
Um, and uh, Goldfaden made a, a really wonderful quote I found. I do not have any complaints about the American Yiddish theater not recognizing its father. In other words, when theater came to America, it changed completely because it Americanized. He added, it is not rare that children do not recognize their parents or even that the parents cannot travel the road their children have gone. So in other words, it came here and it changed. And they of course started to build grand theaters as the very famous one you mentioned uh, was built. I don't wanna to do too much on just Yiddish theater because they can spend the whole time on it. But of course the grand theater was built in 1903 and uh, the New York Times wrote that the Yiddish population is composed of confirmed theater goers, has been evident for a long time, and for many years at least three theaters which had served their day of usefulness for the English dramas have been pressed into service, providing amusement for the people of the ghetto. And so the numbers of people going to Yiddish theater were incredible. Yiddish newspapers, Yiddish uh, books, of course, how do you pronounce her name? Molly Pecan, or how do you guys, how, how would you pronounce her name? Molly Pecan, I think. Pecan, yeah. Obviously, she's the most famous one, the only one many of us have heard of. But there were so many Yiddish writers. So the first golden age is considered the early 1900s, when about half a million Jews moved to New York. That's when the, of course, the, the big grand theater had been opened. Uh, they had plays like The Jewish Hearts, The Living Corpse. We also know that Yiddish can be very harsh language, so they were not afraid to enter into this kind of difficult. Uh, and so for about a five year period, it had a golden age. But then when it started to dissipate because of World War I and so forth, it had another golden era after World War I where the Dybbuk came into popularity. And then when the Roaring Twenties came and it looked like Yiddish theater was gonna disappear, it had another golden age. Um, and so with people like Sholem Alechem, of course. Um, so there were several time periods where it boomed and continued until the 1940s. So, uh, and, and again, it, it's incredible to think that Yiddish theater could have lasted that long because what do you think about all the children of the Yiddish speakers? What did they not necessarily speak? Yeah, a lot of the children didn't speak Yiddish, I would imagine. You hear about the first generation, but the second generation, they forced you to learn English. So how did Yiddish theater survive? It's amazing. They must have, and so I'm not sure how so many people were able to, um, and we had a question, do you think the 18th, 19th century uh, uh, Bachten winning entertainment influenced the generation of Jewish theater? We're gonna talk about that, but yes, a lot of the Jewish musical theater comes from Jewish wedding music, funny enough, that is actually really true. And from Jewish music from other venues, um, because as we know, Jews did not have, you know, a lot of access to music in certain places. And so their music where they did have access to was for certain things like weddings. So let's go to, um, oh. any questions? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So I think that they, the children did learn Yiddish because I personally knew the Adlers, the Adlers, Bruce Adler and his parents. Really? I went to the same bungalow colony as them. And they did Yiddish theater back in the 70s, 60s even, a little bit. But they, they knew Yiddish perfectly. So okay. a lot of them did teach the children Yiddish and spoke it. And, and it shows you that the, uh, the stereotype is not always true that they didn't teach the next generation Yiddish. Right, right. they right. must have, because it became very popular through the 1940s. Is this, is this the, the, the Adler, Jacob and Sarah Adler and Luther Adler family? Stella Adler. Um, well, I, Bruce, I knew personally, but um, I don't. Know, and there was another one. Is that he their was family? Very, he was another Yiddish player, and I can't think of his name. He had a funny name, but he was in my camp, Kindervel, <laughs> that I went to. Um, a famous, another Yiddish player. I'm sorry, I can't think of his name like right now. But like I said, Bruce was young. He was like 
young in the 19, I, I want to say in the 1960s, Bruce Adler was young and his parents were there. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the same Adler. It could be, it might be different. So the, there's a very right. famous Adler family that a lot of acting teachers, a lot of actors, all part of it. I don't know. But be, yeah. So mm -hmm. when it comes to what we would think of theater, we're not gonna go to vaudeville right now because we're thinking more of theater. Of course, obviously Broadway is theater. I mean, that's, that's, and the number, I mean, there's a lot of documentaries on the Jews of Broadway and so forth. To say Jews became synonymous with Broadway theater would be an understatement. I mean, as I mentioned, Jews built Hollywood, but it wasn't as well known that Jews were behind the cameras of the actors because you kind of hid your Jewishness. And the theater, that was not true because not only were Jews going to theater and vaudeville, were they not only actors and producers, but by and large, if you wanna find one area where Jews dominated beyond any other area, it's gotta be Broadway music. Composers. It's composers. Because if you think of the list of composers that I would know years later, let's think about them. Gershwin Brothers, Oscar Hammerstein, Richard Rosers, Lawrence Hart, Kurt Weil, Leonard Bernstein, and then later ones more, Stephen Sondheim, John Kander, Fred Ebb, um, Charles Strauss, Stephen Schwartz, and those of course are more you know, recent ones, but almost every major theater composer, I mean, Broadway composer was Jewish. And we, of course, we haven't even mentioned Irving Berlin. So, um, and so the music they took to Broadway had to obviously stem from this understanding of Yiddish music, a lot of wedding music, a lot of Jewish music that's been passed down went into these shows. And what you were seeing was a very Jewish feel, but it wasn't just Jewish because these Broadway entertainers did not want to recreate, recreate Yiddish music or wedding music or pura music as it was, they felt they had to change it and integrate it. And what did they use to integrate this music into America? They used, of course, African-American music, as we all know. So um, that is really what, what um, Broadway became. It became a a uh, symbiotic relationship between Jewish music and African-American music. And so it's really quite amazing to, to see that these Jewish entertainers understood that this form being created by people who were completely ostracized and obviously had no opportunities would be so important to this world. So at first, they would start with what we call some ragtime music. Um, I guess that's what it's called. We're not talking jazz yet. It's called pre, it's the pre-jazz music. And it, of course, the most famous of all of this, all of these beginnings was Alexander's Ragtime Band by Irving Berlin in 1911. He had written Yiddel on your fiddle play, which I had not heard of. Before, the year before using similar music, but then realized it would be better if you brought it to a more American audience as opposed to just, you know, a tin pan alley. So, I mean, so he changed it and brought it into America. So Alexander's Ragtime Band is one of those changing musical pieces that basically said, we're getting rid of this old music. <laughs> this new music is taking over. So a lot of people have compared it to Chuck Berry's rollover Beethoven saying basically the snappier cool music is what we're gonna be using, but we'll still be using semblances of the past, but we're making it better. And so it starts with Jewish ragtime. And then of course, it will move, move into Jewish jazz. And again, a lot of African-American composers say that 
Jewish composers ripped off their melodies, which is probably very true. But again, we all know how in music, the musical world, it's not always easy to prove that. And obviously, if you're an African American, it, you probably had very little opportunity to take people to court for this. But there were, it was a, it was this really, you know, George Gershwin Swanee, of course, became probably the most famous Jewish jazz song. And of course, Al Josen playing the jazz singer obviously uh, changed everything. And the jazz singer, by the way, is a, is a, is the, uh, what are we saying? The exception to the rule because the jazz singer became a movie on Jewish theme, not only Jewish theme, but a very Jewish movie that became a major hit. Whereas in most cases, there were no Jewish themed movies that were hits until Gentleman's Agreement in the 1940s and very few afterwards. But in the, the theater world, you could have all of these hits. You could have things that were overtly Jewish, overtly African-American. Of course, when you went on the theater and you sang a lot of these songs, how did you dress? You dressed in blackface, which of course today we know all the issues we're seeing today. But in the teens and especially 20s, that's what you did. I mean, Al Jolson in the movie dresses in blackface. Neil Diamond in the 1970s movie, which is not very good. The music's amazing, yes. but the movie's not that good. He even yes. is in blackface. I mean, the music I love from that movie. And he, yes. I thought he was great. And Lucille Ball's daughter is, is I enjoyed knowing that she, but what you have next is you've got these people and then you take that into more big band. So you've got ragtime music, jazz, and then it goes into big band, which is all based on this. And who do you have in big band that also would go into Broadway? Betty Goodman, He's Mel Goodman. May, Artie Shaw. So all these people. So it was really quite amazing that when it came to musical theater, not, not all theater, but all theater was integrated, but certainly musical theater even more. And what was even more amazing about musical theater is what they were willing to talk about. Even, the, you know, we think about, of course, obviously, uh, Fiddle on the Roof, talking about Jewish persecution, but poor, is it Porgy and Bess, which I've actually never seen, Rhapsody in Blue. Um, what other famous uh, musicals talked about racism? So, showboat. 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 Thank you. That was one I couldn't forget. Showboat. Um, so they were willing to broach these subjects, which was very much off limits in movies. Uh, Larry. Yeah, I just wanted to make one additional comment. Uh, I remember reading in Alan J. Lerner's um, book where um, he talked about um, some of the some of the what he called, you know, the transition points. And he thought World War One was really the ending of World War One. He called it uh, the deviantization of the American musical, mm. because up until that time, there were so many of the um, operetta, Sigmund Ronberg, the waltz time, and he credits Jerome Kern more than anybody else who really? wrote Joe but he credits him with going from the uh, the wall style to the um, to more of the ballad style, which uh, then opened the door, obviously, for all different things, you know, um, of types of musical theater. So um, that was one additional point. World War One, the ending, yeah. of the, cutting the tries with Europe. And it's really amazing too, because if you think about it, all of these musicians kept not all of them, but a lot of them kept their name. They didn't change it so they could fit in. I mean, Gershwin, if you're going to change your name to Gershwin, you made a mistake. You're going to change Berlin Hammerstein. Berlin, 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 or something. Yeah, Berlin actually changed his name. Berlin. Rabbi, they're streaming, uh, the Met is streaming Porgy and Bess, if you want to see. It's the one that we saw oh, really? in November. I yeah, know the basis of it. Production. Oh, that's a great idea. I may try that. Thank they you. Don't to see it. Yeah. I'm not sure. I've always wanted to see it. But look I think on it's Friday TV. night. It's Friday is, night. Is it this Friday? I think so. Yeah, but if you production. think about what they're doing, 
is theater opens up its questions that other modes cannot. You think about even the recently, I think about the Book of Mormon. You know, it was an off, you know, you don't, you don't talk about that kind of subject. And all of a sudden it's on Broadway. I have not seen it. I was actually scheduled to see it. I was going to New York uh, a couple of months ago and we were going to go see that, but we didn't obviously. Um, so you think of things like that or, or what's the Avenue Q or, you know, or Hamilton. I mean, I, you know, I, we're watching Hamilton on, uh, we Disney. didn't get to finish yet, but we're watching it on, uh, on Netflix. Disney. On Disney, sorry. And then, <laughs> of course, it's a lot of African-Americans playing these leaders. I mean, so right. musicals especially gave you the opportunity to be really part of that world with very little restrictions. And if you think of the, anybody who's been in a play today, you know, you go in, well, there were restrictions obviously, but very little compared to the outside world. But if you go to, for instance, any um, high school for the arts in any major city, you're gonna have a wide range of people there and they could not care less if you're black or white, woman, straight, they don't trans. It's just not part of, you know, their world is whoever, whoever. And they have to understand that they're going to be working with whoever. And if they don't want to work with a, with Jews, then they can't go into certain productions. If they're not going to work with African-Americans, they can't go into certain productions. If they're not going to work with people who are gay. They can't go into certain productions. So it really opens up theater in ways that other, almost every other field could not be compared. So, Rabbi? Yes. Uh, I think we're giving a little short shrift to the Yiddish theater, straight theater, the dramas, because in fact, that opened up a whole bunch of ideas and themes that came over to the musicals, but were really verboten at the time. There was a lot of family drama. Uh, there was a lot of infidelity in the theater. There was with Shalom Ash, there's a Broadway play about it now called Indecent, mm -hmm. which actually had a gay couple kissing on stage and caused the theater to be raided. So uh, this idea of an openness to societal issues came out of the straight theater, I think, Yiddish straight theater, before it ever evolved into the, mu evolved into the musicals. Yeah, and I, and I apologize. I didn't mean to, to, to announce straight theater. What I'm saying is in Broadway musicals, mm -hmm. there was more Jews integrated in Broadway musicals than anything else. Absolutely. There were lots of Jews in all theater, but Broadway musicals, it was almost all Jews. But in straight theater, obviously, all these themes were coming up. And as we know, there was even African uh, Black theater, African American. So there was a wide range. So theater, certainly beyond anything else. Uh, Larry. Yeah, and, but uh, just uh, one other comment. It's interesting to compare the two other large immigrations that came to America around the same time, the Eastern European, which was largely Jewish, and also the Irish immigration. Now, Ireland has a wonderful uh, theatrical uh, heritage. Uh, their plays are generally uh, non-musicals and their plays are generally serious. And they made very little impact on Broadway. Um, maybe Eugene O'Neill, you know, who's Irish heritage and he wrote more about America, but the Irish plays really didn't come into, um, into, um, into musicals or things. So I think really America made the choice that music was really the way to go, you know, for as far as popularity. Um, the Irish, even though they have wonderful music, uh, they, they never really made it into, um, you know, um, the George M. Cohan, maybe, you know, some of his early musicals, the Yankee Doodle Banding. Uh, they made an attempt, but they really didn't um, have much footing compared to the, uh, to the Jewish. So I think the Jewish theater really pushed into the musical era much more than anybody else, even though there were some dramas. The other place where music made a tremendous influence was uh, in opera you see a lot of the cantors or people with cantorial training, Richard Tucker and the Jan Pierce and the Robert Merrill and the Roberta Peters. I mean, they're not, um, you know, Leonard Bernstein, of course, um, you know, their training and their voices really were what made the difference. They didn't compose as much of the music or very little in opera, but, um, but the, the performances really uh, with, with um, Jewish uh, stars 
in opera were very prominent. Well, by the way, that is, I think that's excellent points. And I'm not very familiar with opera, unfortunately, but I do know cantors have been in that area. But again, again, it's really strange, right? I, I don't know if the Irish didn't make as much of an imprint because there were fewer numbers or they didn't all live in the same place or it was just not the wrong time period because we know the Irish were educated, the most educated people in Europe during the dark ages even. But it is interesting to see how Jews became so prominent in this field. By the way, I am going to be taking the YouTube video of this and editing out uh, Jane and Larry because nobody should be allowed to be in our video if they're wearing jackets in July. <laughs> Edit it out completely. Uh, in fact, I don't it's even. Wor I think, it's warming up now. It's about I, seventy-five. I think you should take off your video. By the way, <laughs> your jacket. No, just we're not going to look at you in the video anymore. Oh, we can turn off. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. So, but that's. I mean, again, this is. I mean, you can't yeah, go yeah, over yeah. the names because there's so many. But what we can do is look at in the heights. Would in the heights have happened without Phil on the roof? With rent have happened wow. without Porgy and Bess? Right. I mean, these are the questions I think that are very obvious. Like, how can you have rent, which is obviously on a very controversial subject, um, and yet it's Broadway that really is the first one to start talking about, you know, so, and um, so again, it's really interesting uh, that uh, Jews had such influence in this area, but again, I mean, today there's still lots of Jews in the the world. This world, it's obviously not the um, the same amount as it was because you're, we're such a small percentage. But it still continues to be a popular venue for Jews, especially. Um, but again, Hollywood has taken a lot of that as well because there's so much more money to be made in Hollywood. So we also know in the theater. If you want to be a dancer or something, I, you know, you have to be young. You got to be in your 20s because you're not making any money. If you want to make money, you've got to do stuff in film or TV and then go back to theater. So there's this kind of um, semblance. If you want to be purely a Broadway actor, actress, it's very hard to make a good living. And if you want to be a Broadway dancer, you've only got a few short years. And if you, got to, if you want to be a Broadway singer, you're going to probably be in the chorus most of the time. So it's, it's just such a competitive field. Rena and then Sheila. Well, I just wanted to ask a question. What does anybody think, or you, Rabbi, about the phenomenon of the talent, the musical talent of Jewish people? Is it in the DNA? No, I'm serious. I mean, that is a great I, question. I really would like to know. I, <laughs> you know, it's not being prejudiced in any way, saying, well, wonderful, but it is a phenomenon to me. You know? Yeah, it is a great debate. I think, again, I think one of the things is, is DNA, you, we've, I think you can add on to your DNA, it seems like. And if the violin had been an in instrument that's been part of the Jewish world for a thousand years, then it's, you know, it's just part of the blood. So it makes it a little bit easier if you're educated and you've been in this field for a long time, then it's easier to go into it. Is it DNA? Who knows? It's, it's impossible to know. I think a lot of it has to do with Ed being educated, mm -hmm. uh, families staying in the business, being able, families being able to support you while you're off on this venture until you can make your own money. I think it's once a lot of people are in that world that are Jewish, you feel it's like your cousins are in that business. I'll go into business with my cousins. I think it's a little bit of everything. Um, but I, as we can see before the 19th century, there are not very many famous Jewish musicians because obviously they weren't, didn't have access to it. Right. So it has a lot to do with access as well. I mean, obviously Felix Mendelssohn who converted, but out of Judaism, but there's not, but it's, I think it's access, education, um, um, and being a part of uh, that musical world for a very long time, support by your parents who encourage their children to take up instruments when they're young. And I think that has a lot to do with it. So, but it's, it's, it'll be interesting seeing if the, 
if with intermarriage and conversions that, you know, if the Jewish population remains such a vital part of Broadway in the future, it's hard to tell. I was talking to somebody and then I'll go to Sheila and then Larry again was saying, we're talking, it was a professor in Israel and he was talking about how, you know, there's so many Jews who have done so well in science and in medicine, but he didn't know if that was gonna be true in the future because again, there's the world is now international and so many Jews are going into business and it's just, there's so many people in that world. Sheila and then Larry. Oh, Larry, I was just gonna say, the Irish gave us river dance <laughs> can't forget that. No, no, that was right, Larry. Uh, kind of one off, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but it was beautiful. Yeah, you're right. We'll go uh, Larry and then Judy. Yeah, no, the other thing that was also, uh, I think, uh, very helpful for the Jews was the fact that it did happen in New York, as yeah. you mentioned. So they did have a built-in audience, in effect, for um, a musical ear to some extent, you know, that they came in and they heard music that was familiar. And I think, uh, I remember the Cantor last year, he did some wonderful things where he even showed uh, some of the Chazanut, um, how it weighed, made its way right. into some of the tunes. You remember those? And uh, it was really right. entertaining. He did a terrific uh, a yeah. uh, little talk on that right. uh, to show how yeah. that so it was a uh, it was even though it had ragtime in it it had some other melodies that were now infiltrating um the audience was built in for them so that they um, you know they were popular there could have been a lot of other composers you know just like in art you know there's guys whose paintings it. are wonderful but they're in the basement someplace right. you know because the the audience wasn't right that timing yeah judy yeah, I just wanted to say, <clears throat> I agree with you about the, the music, of kind of a funny thing, but I mean, I have a picture of my dad with his violin class. They were all Orthodox Jews when he was about 11, and, um, and his parents spent a, a lot of money to buy him a good violin that they didn't have, but it was important, and then I have it, and we all played. Uh, but the, uh, there's a, this Israeli TV show called Questions You Don't Dare Ask. And um, one of the weeks they had on of these Russian Jews and they, people had submitted questions and they all said, how many musical instruments do you play? And they all answered, they were all playing like three or four because they said it was something they could do. And it's just inbred in our culture. I mean, I know like when I played an orchestra, every Jewish kid in my junior high or few in my high school, every Jewish kid was in the orchestra. I mean, that was just, what you did, or you, or the, some of the girls instead were in ballet, but we could afford to take those private lessons, and it was encouraged. And you often had the instruments in your home because your parents played, and that was, that was. I think it's just part of our culture. I mean, how many here? I'm just curious, how many here play one or two instruments? I play the piano. <laughs> yeah, I'm like piano, violin. I played the French horn. I mean, it was like there wasn't enough. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, I, I played the kazoo. What'd you play? I played the kazoo. The kazoo? Oh, yeah. you you're musical. That's okay. But I think the arts in general have always been important to Jews. So it's, it's museums, I mean, the supporters, the founders, um, and just, I mean, I think the museum one. attendance is very high among Jews. Certainly, I mean, we go to theater even on Hilton Head. Uh, what is it, a 300 seat? I look around and I probably know a third, sometimes city. more than a third of the people at the people theater. There. I mean, so I think it's just always been high on uh, it's high agree, and it's priorities. A, yeah. It's the same in Savannah when they have yeah. all, you know, they have their yep. classical yeah. concerts or it's there's, you know, such a high percentage of Jews go to everything. All right, that's great. I, think, I mean, it's a great topic. I'm sorry, go ahead, Stuart. I think that some of this, the musical stuff and the performance goes back to some basics of the religion. Uh, in a lot of Christianity, specific, particularly Roman Catholicism, uh, it's a preaching at you. It's a speaking from the pulpit, listening from the cheap seats, so to speak. Whereas most Jewish service or a great portion of Jewish service has always been participative. Uh, if you look at many of the prayers, the whole idea of the uh, Call it Kriya, of the cantor is reciting prayers for the Jews who were not able to read and do it by themselves. And that's unique to Judaism. So I think perhaps there's this musical ear that's developed 
because of the essence of the religion, uh, you know, or an essential characteristic in the religion that is not so much in the other Western religions. Well, I, I may not be Jewish, so I apologize. I may have to leave. <laughs> I was not, my mom didn't even let me take piano lessons. So my brother got them, but I wasn't allowed to take them. And, <laughs> yeah, I could do it. Yeah. Rabbi do it, now. do it now. There's a guy online teaching piano for people during COVID. Not really, I'm sure. Yeah. Not. He says, don't just dust your piano. And I, I'll, I'll send it to you. I was like, I just dust mine. And dust, so. <laughs> well, the, I think the rabbis, and we'll finish with Larry, say that any rabbi who plays a musical instrument doesn't deserve to be a rabbi. I think that's <laughs> an old saying. And we'll finish with Larry. Oh, thank you. For the, the, um, the other thing that comes to mind is the Jews almost seem like they want to be entertained. Like you go, I remember in synagogues in Brooklyn that we grew up on, there were always wonderful cantors and wonderful choirs so that people would come to a high holiday service and they would be, you know, go there to see a particular cantor, a particular choir. Uh, and I know there's always a debate as, you know, far as how much prayer and how much entertainment you should have in it. You know, does the choir sing more than the participatory singing and things like that? So I think there, there was this sense that uh, religion could be intertwined with sort of a, um, a participatory uh, sing-along entertaining kind of thing. I see. And these are all good points. And again, if you've lived in New York or New, that area, which I haven't, you have access to all of these things, some of it going on, some of it history, but it's such a vibrant area for the Jewish world. I'm from a small town in Texas, so I did not have access, but it's, it, I didn't know about it. Even down there, I knew a little bit. So, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Next week, we're going to talk about Jewish Supreme Court justices. And as we know, and I think before the recent, uh, before the last two were, were put in, one of the great things about America that says so many wonderful things about us is until the last two Supreme Court justices, if we had gone back five years ago, out of the nine Supreme Court justices five years ago, zero were Protestants. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and we're a country that was built by Protestants. I mean, we're built on the Protestant faith in many respects. And yet we're a country in which every one of the, Jew the Supreme Court justices were either Catholic or Jewish at one point. And that just shows a lot about our country, how impressive it is that we would, would do that. Um, you know, so one other thing, uh, he never mentions it, but uh, Sid Schwartz played the ukulele on Grand Ole Opry. Oh, did, really? Did you? <laughs> and he's awesome. I, 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 watched it. I was wondering if that was you, and it was. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's so Bye -bye. it's unfortunate, though, because Cantor Fortnoy has already recorded all the music for High Holiday, so said, we'll have you next year. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.